Hello and welcome to episode 6 of The Filmmaking Behind, a series where we break down and analyse video game cutscenes filmically to see how they work and why. Last week you were given the choice between two giant games, Shadow of the Colossus or Monster Hunter, and it was clear that you guys wanted to analyse Shadow of the Colossus. So here's Shadow of the Colossus. Less words means more meaning, right? Also, do excuse my voice today, I ran out of hay fever medicine and I have really bad hay fever this morning, so I'm very... <laughs> It shouldn't be too much of a problem though. So the story begins with a fade from black onto an unclear and dark horizon, followed by a bird flying across the frame for the camera to loosely follow, all the while some angelic kind of tribal music plays in the background. So far this already tells us the main tone for the entire game. We can see from the camera's view that this location is grand and mostly untouched by civilization. therefore it comes off as a kind of sacred or at least special place, which the music only adds to create more of that sense of whimsicality. As the camera continues to follow the bird we finally get introduced to our protagonist, Wanda. The bird was simply a transitional tool, but gives off that sense of being a spectator on the event that are about to play out. From this point we focus on to Wanda and his horse Agro as they continue their journey, using wide shots to pull into the frame the large scope of the environment the two are in, adding emphasis to both the actions required to move forwards as well as highlights the sense of spectating as the camera is just kind of flying above and around them. And for the final shot in this little scene, we see Wanda and Agro silhouette against the distant land in front of them. By positioning behind them, we're focusing more on their path forwards from here rather than the journey they've completed this far, and as the characters are small on the frame, it suggests that there's much more travelling ahead of them. Finally, positioning them on the right-hand side of the frame allows them to push further this sense of moving forward as they start moving out of frame to the right, which usually is the designated hero's direction in any film. Good guys go left to right. A little later on we see another scene begin with a shot of the sky, showing it's raining, creating your typical pathetic fallacy by suggesting there's some kind of dread occurring. This is juxtaposed by Wanda's determination to continue through the rain, utilising a major theme for Wanda as a character and the story as a whole, of pushing through sadness and dread to get what you want, sacrificing getting wet to get to the destination. And as they get closer to the wall, the music climaxes to suggest their destination has finally been reached. It is an epic and sacred place. We then see the rain has suddenly stopped, as if to suggest that now the destination has been reached, there is no more dread to push the protagonist back. It could also highlight how important this destination is as the weather is completely different here, but that's just speculation on my part. Walking through the opening, the music begins triumphant and glorious before the camera moves ahead of Wanda to show the large fields of land enveloping this sacred place. The camera turns up before switching to an extreme wide shot of the bridge to really create that godly feeling and further highlights the large scope of the area before once again turning up to the sky. Truly angelic angles. And now, with the music finished, we come closer to Wanda's actions again as he comes closer to the entrance. Not so much giving a godly spectator feel for the audience, but more of a personal one, closer to Wanda as if we're kind of watching from his perspective at this point. And to add drama, we cut to the other side of the entrance as it opens and light leads into the darkness. Once they're in, the door shuts and Wanda's turn behind him tells us that he's aware his choice of coming here has been locked into place. Inside we're seeing more wide shots of the place to establish the scene for the audience, before coming back to Wanda at the bottom of the stairs. And the music reappears once in the main room, and the camera keeps behind Wanda to still create that personal tone, but looking around the room to show the large scope. It's at this point we come close up to Wanda as we see him get off of aggro with purpose. It's here we can also see that he comes with someone else, and a foot to truly reveal their human. Once at the altar, we see Wanda positioned on the right facing left, suggesting he's not the perfect hero at this moment, as this is the classic stance for a villain. This shot also utilises the frame within a frame technique between the two pillars and suggests Wanda is being caged due to both being shut into this building so far and because perhaps he has no alternatives to achieve his desires. We come close up to Wanda again to highlight his actions clearly for the audience to see and witness his expression of determination for whatever is about to happen next. Next we see a mask slowly moving closer to the camera in the centre of the frame above a smoking map. The sound effects suggest a fire, keeping that kind of tribal and ancient tone. We then get some expositional speech about how this land is forbidden but can revive the dead, telling the audience the purpose of Wanda's arrival without using an interaction between talking characters. The scene also plays off like a segment of a campfire story, more like a legend being told, fitting further with the game's atmosphere. And next we pull back from Wanda to reveal some shadow men pulling out of the ground. With a slow dramatic turn of the camera and Wanda's almost sensual motions, we see that Wanda is unafraid of the monsters as he points his glowing sword towards them. 
again positioning him to the right facing left. The camera then has a wide shot showing the shadows suffering, wow what a sentence, before flying through their smoky remains and turning up to the hole in the ceiling. This then transitions to a stormy sky, suggesting this action has caused a stir over the forbidden land in some way. And at this point, our next character Dormin appears and speaks to Wanda. The camera stays looking up at the glowing hole in the ceiling to suggest Dormin is somewhat godlike and not a simple human. They also have two different voice actors, one male and one female, to suggest that there is no gender or physical entity. Once again in Wanda's shots, he faces right to left until this slowly changes as he explains his reasoning, showing he has good intentions even though his actions may not be entirely heroic. While Dorman speaks, the shots return to the godly wide-angled shots again to allow for more emphasis of the mystique of the land, as Dorman themselves seem mystical and godly. It also allows the audience to see in more detail Wanda's surroundings, such as the idols of the Colossi in the room and the girl, Mono's, face. At the end of the scene, we get a movement onto a wide shot of the vast lands ahead of Wanda, before Dorman tells him to go and find the first Colossus in this direction. From here, the camera is used to suggest Wanda's path forward once again, as his journey is far from over. Okay, first Colossus time. The introductory scene begins with Wanda placed tiny on the frame in the bottom right hand corner. This achieves multiple things quite fluidly. His small frame compares to that of the Colossus and thus makes him seem less powerful and significant. This continues further as he's on the bottom of the frame and the Colossus is literally above him. And keeping him on the right facing left continues the idea that he's acting in a non-heroic manner. Now before we see the actual Colossus, we first hear its roar, followed by a single giant foot and then a slow movement following its body. These all add suspense as we still haven't fully revealed the Colossus since we haven't seen its face, and we are watching it from behind some rocks and foliage behind it, also adding more dominance to the Colossus as not even the camera wants to be discovered by it yet, mimicking Wanda's actions. And now the gameplay begins, and honestly the majority of the gameplay says enough for the filmmaking. The Colossus is placed a little away from you but still towers enormously over the frame, and as you climb up its body the camera focuses more on the little actions of Wanda rather than the full scope of the Colossus. Once at the top you finally get to see the Colossus below Wanda as the power dominance shifts between the characters, and once the final blow is hit we come back to the cutscene format. Here we start with a harsh low angle of the Colossus to highlight its size once again before pulling the camera back a little bit in the next shot, this time encapsulating most of the Colossus into the entire frame and giving it plenty of headspace above it to minimise its size a little bit, all the while we see its head spurting a stream of blood. The camera then slowly pans down in preparation for the Colossus's final action of collapsing to the ground, capturing it entirely in the frame to show how its dominance has been completely taken away. The music also sounds mystical, but almost a little bit sad. And next we see Wanda stabbed by some sort of dark energy, before transitioning us back to the altar, now with one shadow man facing over Wanda's unconscious body. When he awakens, he continues to face right to left on the frame, before the camera uses a harsh high angle watching Wanda and the altar from Dorman's outlook, again giving the audience that sense of godly spectatorship. At the altar, the background light blooms heavily to put all emphasis on the structure holding Mono and taking away from any distractions that the view might give beyond her. And with dramatic triumphant music, we see one of the Colossus Idols explode. At this point, the game becomes quite formulaic and uses the same camera techniques of looking up at Dormin and changing to the next Colossus Idol, so we're now going to skip to each Colossus intro. So Colossus number 2, Quadratus. This guy starts off with a large door shot as this is where it appears from. We see this come into play as the ground begins to rumble and we see debris falling briefly. Next we see a closer shot of the door, now angling it to face left facing right as it storms through. Now the dramatic music begins to initiate the fight. We also get a closer shot of Quadratus' face, revealing more of the type of colossus he is in quite an intimidating manner. The camera here then stays static as it continues moving forward to allow the audience to assess how to tackle this colossus and to see how it is literally four-legged, switching away from the bipedal first colossus Valus. And on its destruction, we get a similar camera shot from that of Valus's as it falls to the side. Number 3, Gaius, plays out a little different. For a start, its introduction begins with a pan of its laid down body, revealing its existence here, but not enough to perceive what it actually looks like other than rubble. As the camera slowly turns, we see it come to life before the camera pulls back and we can see clearly what this guy looks like. Now it's positioned high up on the frame, again to highlight its height through the low angle and to give it that classic Colossus power. Next cutscene we see from Gaius is actually during the battle. We see its sword break onto the ground before the camera zooms in onto its now exposed elbow. This technique creates a unique feel where it feels like you're actually included in the scene and simply turning and focusing on a particular element of the scene rather than being a flying camera that can just float on over to it. 
The camera then pulls back away from the face again to transition players back into the gameplay and return us to our position at the start of this little shot. Once defeated, we see Gaia still up high but from behind, taking away a little bit of power. We next get a wide shot of the plateau it stands on as it crumbles on the left hand side of the frame. The extreme wide shot again shrinks its power due to its size on the frame being much smaller, as well as continues to push it into a hero's composition. Colossus 4 Phaedra has an interesting little shot where the camera slowly moves towards it as it stands up and changes to a diagonal low angle shot of its face. It then switches to behind Phaedra to show Wanda as a dot in size. Upon its death, the camera starts from a high angle to minimize its size before reverting to its normal side-on shot of Phaedra as it falls to the floor. The fifth Colossus Avion starts with an environmental shot of the area which pans up to the sky to reveal it flying through it. Next we get a trailing shot tracking its flight path before a wide shot of it landing on a pedestal and returning back to Wanda. Meanwhile, upon its death, its wide shot begins as a floating high angle as it begins to fall before changing to an extreme wide angle version of the side-on shot of the Colossus's fall as it crashes into the water. Now keeping Avion on the lower half of the frame and then completely small compared to the rest of the frame. Barber begins similarly to Quadratus in that they both start with a door, but it's revealed in a much more docile manner as the camera slowly moves up its body to reveal its face. We then also get a quick shot of it destroying a wall mid-battle, and once again it's positioned in the heroic composition. During its death scene, it starts with a normal low angle on the beast and turns across its body as it runs and trips away from the camera. Hydra keeps up this docile tone as we begin with an ambient pan to the right across the lake, and eventually underwater where we see it slowly sliver into shot. The electric tongue is drawing the player's attention and foreshadowing its electrical mechanics. Next we get a low angle shot of Hydra just to give it its power dominance for a moment. When dying, the camera returns above the lake again to limit Hydrus' power before switching to the same underwater low angle shot with a different meaning this time as it is motionless and slowly falling to the bottom of the lake. Kuramori gets a dramatic Colosseum location which has the camera go through one of the barred windows and down onto the harsh high angle on the Colossus. The turning of the shot also adds more drama to it. Overall, this kind of shot makes the beast seem less powerful as it's caged, small on the frame and being looked down on, but this could also be because its strength doesn't come from its size, and by looking out of a window and down, you almost get the sense of dread to look at it, as it gives that uncomfortable feeling of when looking over a cliff to a deadly drop, or in this case, a deadly foe. Kuromori's death sequence also begins with a harsh high angle before switching to a normal side-on slightly low angle as it fully flops onto the floor. At this point we get an interesting little scene of a premonition of Wanda's, showing Mono waking up. For this scene the shots also have an old timey filter on them as well as a lot of overbearing bloom to create that sense of distance to the scene. The music is also slightly fuzzy to keep up that sense that this isn't quite reality yet. The scene ends with the camera being pulled very far away from Mono with a distorted static sound taking away from the music, foreshadowing later events. Vassaran's intro doesn't really stand out too much to me, though it is interesting that this is the first Colossus to be in the position on the right hand side of the frame facing left. His death scene also remains quite formulaic, keeping the standard death shot. Now Durg gets a really cool introduction, whereby the camera remains low to the ground and swooping below and along it until we eventually see its face at the end of the body. For Durg's death though, not too much happens, the camera simply pulls away to shrink Durg's size little by little. Celosia gets a really good introduction too. Starting off, the camera pans up a wall to eventually reveal Celosia's position up high. It then dives off its shelf, which causes the camera to quickly 180, and then turns around at the end of the room with the camera focusing on it in a head-on position. This also links to Wanda's perspective here as this is the smallest colossus, and so Wanda and it are the closest eye level out of all of the colossi, though it is still like the size of an elephant, and it did have a little bit of power at the beginning because it was higher up on the frame. Its death is quite basic, keeping it quite small on the frame and slightly high angled to give a subtle feeling of being looked down upon due to its lost power. Much like Hydra's, Pelagia also starts off underwater, however its approach to the reveal is much different. It begins with an underwater shot of it revealing very little detail of its design before switching to above the water to reveal nothing. This is a much slower and more suspenseful reveal compared to Hydra's. Pelagia then slowly rises out of the water from the wide shot and becomes bigger on the frame as the camera gets closer and it stands taller. Its death scene then begins with a head-on low angle shot as it stands on its hind legs before the next shot of the classic wide angled side on view as it topples backwards into the water. At this point we now get a scene from far away. The first shot establishes this by showing us a wide shot of the forbidden lands off in the distance. Next we see horses feet running through the water to tell us there's a subtle sense of urgency in this new character's actions. Then we see a high angle of the riders from behind some foliage, suggesting that we too are spectating and hiding away from them due to the mystery of their identity. The camera is being cautious and thus creates suspense as it reveals little about the characters. 
Slowly, the camera comes closer to reveal the intricacies of their leader, who holds the mask shown from the beginning of the game, suggesting there is a connection there, which implies they know of the legend of this place and what it entails. The music also paints them in a kind of angelic light. After this short teaser of a scene, we come back to Mono. Phalanx gets extreme wide shots on their exit simply due to their colossal size. This is the largest colossus in the game, and although the frame keeps Phalanx quite small and contained, they always remain in the top half of the frame to give its power dominance through its height advantage. Its death then continues from a dramatic tracking shot onto a high angle shot placing it down to the bottom of the frame as it falls, and then we get our classic side on shot. Phalanx also dies composed to face left to right. Zenobia initially is shown up high in the frame 2 at the top of a staircase. The camera then stays close to him to reveal its design to the player. Interestingly, Zenobia is composed right to left, but once in action, is recomposed to the opposite. I'm not sure what the actual purpose of this is, other than to add some dramatic spice to this shot, but oh well. Even as Zenobia is literally going down the stairs though, the framing keeps its power by remaining low angle for the most part and keeping Zenobia larger on the frame as it runs briefly towards the camera. Its death is pretty static and standard though. Argus sets a classic giant shot as the camera begins with a panning forward high angle wide shot, keeping Wanda small in the frame and preparing for the appearance of Argus's giant hand. The camera then turns on an anchor point to swish to a view of the other hand, again creating that feeling that you are part of the scene and looking around. And then finally the rest of Argus leaps up from the lower level, keeping his face on the top half of the screen using the low angle. His death sequence is pretty standard though. After 15 different death scenes, it's kind of difficult to not have repetition at this point. We get a swirling high angle of Argus as he stumbles, and then the normal low to the ground shot as he crashes. And now the build up to the final boss. On the bridge leading to the final area, we see Wanda and Agro leap across the frame from left to right before landing on an uneven block. The next shot keeps up with keeping the two in the heroic stand and keeps a kind of low angle as Agro thrusts Wanda forward. We get a standard head-on close-up of Wanda flailing mid-air before seeing him land and roll on the platform. The camera has pulled a 180 degree turn, which makes sense due to the sporadicness and disorientation occurring at this moment in the story. We quickly see a closer shot of Wanda running back, highlighting him and his actions more than the place he's landed now. And we see a representation of Wanda's view as the camera moves to look over and down the cavern as Agro falls with the bridge. Just opposing this is Wanda's shot from a low angle composed right to left again, not to show a villainous intent anymore, but rather to show how Wanda is turned away and looking back on his path at this moment. The music here adds to the sense of sadness and sacrifice Wanda is facing too. And with that, Wanda then stands and turns up as the camera slowly pans up to the top of the plateau as the music ends to suggest that Wanda is fully determined to reach his goal, pushing through his dread and sadness to achieve what he wants. So the final boss, Malice. The final Colossus switches the entire tone of this game for this one battle. Suddenly the weather is dark and stormy, wind has picked up dramatically, and his introductory scene is an incredibly slow paced and suspenseful shot as we slowly raise up its body from a harsh low angle. And upon its defeat we get a mid shot of Malice for a moment, before an extreme wide shot composing it right to left as its lower half crumbles, and then back to another low angle as pieces of debris fall to the surface of the plateau. And now the ending. We come back to the mysterious group with the repetition of the galloping horse hooves. Next we get an establishing shot of them running across the Forbidden Lands Bridge, telling us that they have arrived at their destination right at the height of Wanda's success. And like Wanda's entrance scene, when the group reach the entrance to the altar, the shot comes in closer on the outside before appearing on the other side of the closed door. This time not having the shot finish with the darkness overcoming the light, but rather having the camera closer to the entrance and so having the light overcome the darkness by the end of the shot. We see a familiar camera movement as well for the first staircase as well as the group composed left to right. And once in the altar we see them somewhat small in comparison to the grand size of the room. Then they regain their power dominance in the frame as the camera uses a low turning angle on them. Next we see Wanda slowly being lifted away from the battle scene, initially small but eventually large. Back to the group and Lord Emmon, as he's called, can be seen from a wide angle before closing into them to see their actions on Mono. Once Wanda appears on the scene we see him small and collapsed, with his sword dramatically placed away from him and allowing for an evil composition. Now we see Wanda as a possessed demon, encapsulated by the dark energy contained by the Colossi. Here we get a very standard good versus evil composition between Lord Emmon and Wanda as Emmon's dialogue tells us of the ruin Wanda's actions have brought. And in preparation for Wanda's execution, the camera moves dramatically by having a turning low angle on the knight as it turns down to look at Wanda on the floor. We see a high angle shot from the sword looking down on the demented and upside down in this shot Wanda before coming back to the low angle of the knight, this time omitting Wanda entirely and lifting the knight out of shot upon impact. 
We then see an extreme wide shot of the room afterwards, as is often done after an execution, as it adds drama and a sense of emptiness. The knight's echoing voice adds to this more. Next, we see Wanda struggling with the sword as he begins to disperse the black ooze of the Colossi. And after Wanda walks for a bit, we see from his perspective an attempt to reach Mono unsuccessfully. Once again, he's given the same side on shot as the death of the other 16 Colossi. And as a final twist, the camera pulls away from the group to reveal Wanda getting larger and larger to form the reincarnation of Dorman, who towers over Lord Eben in the villainous composition. The turning low angle here adds to act power to Dorman, whilst adds more and more drama to the scene. The increasing whirling sound also adds a little to this. And with a final high angle shot of Mono and the group, we see Dorman's heightened perspective before returning to gameplay. Upon escaping, we see a lifting low angle shot of the staircase as the group run back up it. At the top, we see Lord Emmons stand at the top of the staircase, again composed like a hero, as he readies Wanda's sword and throws it into the water at the bottom, the camera following the sword before pulling away from the water as it glows a godly light, shaking along with the immense force that it's eventually fading into the white light. The group are seen escaping from the giant bridge with an extreme wide shot as the bridge collapses, truly keeping away any future visitors to the Forbidden Land. And finally, back to the altar, we get an establishing shot bringing us back to the location, before a series of shots of Mono, who eventually opens her eyes. She sits up identically to Wanda's premonition earlier, with the camera slowly turning around her. Getting up, we see her from a distant high angle before seeing her look up at the room while composed left to right. With a whinny, we hear that Agro survived and could be seen approaching Mono with a limp from the left-hand side of the frame, before fading away to white. And thus, the credits roll, showing us the crumbled remains of each of the colossi. And with a final scene, we see Agro and Mono peer into the water again to reveal Wanda, reborn in his most innocent form, a baby. And as the three of them slowly make it to the top of the building, pulls back to reveal that peace and wildlife has returned to the land. And with a final fly away from the scene, we end off with the same bird who flew us into the story in the first place. As the background blooms into a sea of white and transition us to a final view over the Forbidden Land as it now stands in peace and all being told primarily through actions and not words. Well, there's nothing more for me to say really. The game is awfully cinematic and uses this to create meaning and themes within its shots, as well as to highlight the gigantic size of the Colossi and Wanda's sacrifice to save Mono. Right, now as per usual every week, you now get to decide which game we cover for the next episode of The Filmmaking Behind. This time you get the choice between two crazy diversity games. So, would you rather see a video analysing the Subspace Emissary from Super Smash Bros Brawl, or would you rather see some content on the Overwatch animated shorts? It's all up to you. As for now, my name's been Daz, you didn't really care, and I'll see you in a bit.